we're going to be looking this morning. God has spoken. Over the last few weeks, uh, God has been leading my thoughts and my heart towards what we commonly call Easter, but that's probably not the best word for, that, for the Sunday that's coming up because Easter is actually not a Christian term. Traditionally, it's not a Christian term, but when we say Easter, we understand. Um, it's probably better we say Resurrection Sunday. Resurrect, res Resurrection Sunday, two weeks from now. And the Lord has just been speaking to my heart as I've been reading the Word, and even as I've been listening to other pastors and preachers, and even Pastor Renee last week, even though he was talking about Old Testament prophets, um, it it has, I've been encouraged because the Holy Spirit has been sort of hurting me and, and pointing my thoughts towards the death of Jesus, the sacrifice of Jesus, His resurrection, and what it means for us. And so, although this does not look like an Easter or a resurrection topic, we're going to go in that direction uh, this morning. We'll see how far we get and we'll come back to it again. Um, the Lord dropped this in my heart uh, two weeks ago. I had uh, I had gone to a church that uh, in the U.S. and my parents. Uh, it's a church that I'm not a member of, but um, it's kind of the only place where I can go. It's quite a large church. Nobody knows me there, and it was the very last Sunday I was in the U.S. and I was sitting there listening to the pastor, and and he was beginning to talk about uh, Resurrection Sunday and Easter, and he was showing clips from the movie Risen, which we wanted to show here, and then he was he, and he was preaching, and. Um, and as I was listening, the Lord just put something in my heart. I thought, oh, thank you, Lord, because I felt like it was for me and it was for us as well. And as we look this morning, now we'll get there, stay with me, but as we look at Hebrews 1, uh, the very first chapter and the very first verse, we see something. And, and, it, and it's only a few words, but there's so much there. The book of Hebrews, we don't really know who wrote it. Did you know that? All the other books, always, we think it's this person and we think it's that person. A lot of people say, the Apostle Paul wrote this, wrote this book. It's very clear. And others say, very scholarly people say, no, 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 Paul didn't write it. Apollos wrote it, one of the, sort of one of the co-workers and in a way a disciple of Paul. And others say, no, it was written by Priscilla, the wife of Aquila, but she didn't put her name to it because, you know, for a woman to write uh, a book in those days, wow, that would have been quite a, quite a thing. So we don't know. And you know why I don't worry about it very much? Because God didn't tell us. <laughs> And you know what, brothers and sisters, if God doesn't make something really clear to us in His Word, then me, I think we don't have to worry about it too much. We don't, certainly don't, we don't want to get into arguments about it. If we absolutely had to know, God would have given us proof in some way to show us this is the earthly author, so we don't know. What we do know is the heavenly author is God the Holy Spirit because he's the one that inspired. And so Hebrews was written, we're pretty sure, in maybe 67 to 69 AD. Now this is not a history lesson this morning, but this helps us to understand. So this was written maybe almost 40 years after the death and the resurrection and the return to heaven of Jesus. Okay, so around that, about 40 years. And the writer to Hebrews says this. What does he say? He says, Long ago, God spoke many times and in many ways to our ancestors through the prophets. Now, the people receiving this letter were Jewish believers. Now, they were, they were Christians, but their background was Jewish. Uh, do we have anybody here this morning with Jewish blood, literally, physically, in your body? Anyone? Not that I know of, okay? I didn't think so. Who knows? We'll find out in heaven. But, um, but the Bible says we are spiritual. We are spiritual Jews. We're the spiritual descendants of the Lord, which honestly, brothers and sisters, is much, much, much more wonderful than any physical descent, uh, uh, being, uh, being a uh, physical descendant of, of, Jew, of Jewish ancestry. And so... They would have understood when they read this, oh, this is about the Old Testament. This is in the Old Testament. These are the prophets that you've heard Pastor Renee speaking about, Jeremiah, Hosea, some of these other ones. But this book is also for us this morning, for New Testament Christians who are not Jewish by physical birth in any way, but it's for us as well. And it be, he begins, he or she begins by writing long ago. And that means primarily 
under the Old Covenant in Old Testament times. God spoke um, in many, many times in many ways. Now, if you and I were Greek scholars this morning and we could open up our Bibles and read it in Greek, in the Greek, it actually begins many times, many ways. That's how it begins. God spoke. Oh, we don't have translation. Thank you, Miss B. She was sitting up here enjoying the message and she, <laughs> then she suddenly realized translation. So if you are, thank you, Vicki, if you're a Cantonese <laughs> speaker, you're going to have translation in just a minute. She'll catch you up. She's a good translator. I'll give her just a minute. I said a lot, didn't I? <laughs> so, they would have understood, oh, it's this, it's this, and this. And the writer says God spoke many times and many ways. So, I want you to think about that for just a minute. He begins, or the writer begins by saying, long ago God spoke. I want you to think about just those few words, and I want you to think about yourself this morning. You're a pretty smart group this morning. No dummies here. We've studied. We do study. We read. We're smart people. But I want us to understand something this morning. In our natural ability, in your smarts, in all your wisdom, with all of your brain power, with me being a pastor, preacher for all these many years, if God doesn't speak, I can't understand him. I can't know about him. I can't comprehend. God, what are you like? God has to speak. If we are going to know anything about God, God's going to have to speak to us. We could never know about God if he did not speak to us. And so the writer reminds us, in many ways, in many times, in many places, God spoke. And that reminds me, and that's, that tells us this morning, God is such a creative God with no limitations of communication. Think about how, how, how God has communicated. Think about it in the present day world. One of my favorite parts when I think about this is what is happening in the Muslim world, especially in Iran and parts of Saudi Arabia, where a preacher cannot go into a church and publicly preach about Jesus. And yet the Bible says God spoke. God spoke and we're going to talk about Jesus. That doesn't stop God. And in the Muslim world, what's happening now? God, because He speaks, is giving people dreams and visions. And He's working miracles in North Korea. God is speaking. You see, God can speak any language He needs to for a heart that wants to know Him. Do you remember, I, I always, I talk about Big Steve sometimes, and I remember how God spoke to Steve in a way that he needed to hear, and Steve knew this is God, right? Was there any question? Nope. He knew it was God. You ask him sometime about that. And each one of us, God speaks to our hearts. And so this says God spoke in many times in many ways. Now, this refers primarily to the Old Testament, so I want you to think with me for just a minute in the many times and the many ways that God spoke. What were some of the ways that God spoke? And to whom did God speak? Well, if we go all the way back to Adam and Eve before sin, how did God speak to Adam and Eve? Did he have to cover himself or hide in any way? No, before sin. The Bible says God walked with Adam and Eve in the cool of the evening. I love that picture, a picture of peace and relationship. And at other times, as, as things progressed, God spoke and gave Noah a plan. Build a boat. Build a boat and save yourself. God talked with Abraham face to face. How else did God speak? How else did God lead? Through a pillar of fire and a cloud, the children of Israel. How did God speak to Samuel, that little boy who was in the, who was in the temple? Samuel, Samuel, 
the voice of God, speaking to a very young, young child in different ways at different times. You heard Pastor Renee talk about the Old Testament prophets. How did God speak to Hosea? Through a broken marriage. Wow. How did God speak to Jonah? <laughs> a great fish. By the way, that's about Jesus. Did you know that? The great fish swallowing Jonah? That's about Jesus. You say, what? Go back and read. God spoke. How else did God speak to Rahab, the prostitute or the innkeeper? Oh, there's a picture of Jesus again, isn't there? Remember what they said? Take a red rope, a red cord, and hang it out your window, and you'll be saved when the walls of Jericho collapse. And that's a picture of the blood of Jesus. God spoke. Then we come to the Old Testament prophets, and we come, how did God spoke to Jeremiah through, through, through symbols. Isn't that unusual? Through symbols, Jeremiah was supposed to do this. Jer Jeremiah was supposed to do that. To me, when I read some of those things, I think, what? Seems so unusual, doesn't it? But God spoke in many different ways. And if God didn't speak to us, we wouldn't hear him. We wouldn't know anything about him. Last week, Pastor Renee spoke about which prophet? Malachi. Malachi. Thank you for the th three that remembered. <laughs> you remembered, didn't you? And so if I open my Bible to Malachi, what do I come to? Where is Malachi in the Bible? It's in the Old Testament. And it is the last book in the Old Testament. It's the last thing that's written in the Old Testament. And so here we have, so here I have, I'm, I'm at the last pages of Malachi, Malachi chapter 4. And so we're at Malachi. And so God spoke through Malachi. Now, if I turn over my pages after I finished Malachi, what am I going to go to? What's next? So God spoke. What comes next? Oh, Matthew comes next, right? Matthew comes next. So we go from Malachi to Matthew. So God spoke in Malachi. God spoke in Matthew. Was there anything in between? Okay. What was in between? Malachi, when he finished writing, after he finished writing, and before we come into the New Testament time, guess how long there's nothing written. Guess how long there's silence about 400 years. About 400 years. Can you imagine that? 400 years, there's no revelation of God. 400 years, there's no prophet who stands up before God's people and says, repent. There's no prophet who says, thus saith the Lord. This is what God is saying to you. Do this, do that, return to me. All of the things that the prophets preached to God's people. 400 years of silence. And then comes Matthew. So 400 years. But I want us to look at that and see what God was doing and how God was speaking. So 400 years of silence. Was God doing anything? People didn't see it, but God was always doing something. He was always doing something. He was preparing. He was working behind the scenes, if you will, because in 400 years, something very, very special was going to happen. Something very special was going to happen. So what happens? We come to the New Testament now, and what do we see in Matthew 3, 1? In those days... In those days, so it was back then, we read, John the Baptist came to the Judean wilderness and he began preaching. Stop with me. Think about this. We sometimes take this book and we think, ah, oh, so old and dusty and, you know, it's good for doctrine, but ah, brothers and sisters, real people in this book, real people, people like you and people like me, 400 years of silence and then, John came preaching. He began to preach. A person, a man sent from God, a prophet sent from God. I was reading about John, and I want to, I'm, I'm doing more study on him as well. But if you will look at John the Baptist, although he is in the New Testament, if you look at his message and you look at his lifestyle, do you know really what John the Baptist is like? 
John the Baptist is really like an Old Testament prophet, not like, not like what we see in the New Testament. His life, his voice, all of that, it's very much Old Testament. And he stands in the, but he stands in the middle and he gives a bridge to what comes next. Now, you heard Pastor Renee talking last week about the book of Malachi. Stay with me. You're saying, how are you going to get to Easter and Resurrection, Pastor Jennifer? I am. If you look at the last three verses of Malachi, do you know what you will find out? Malachi talks about John the Baptist. You say, what? Does he, does, he, does he say his name? Nope. He doesn't say his name. But he says, I will send the prophet Elijah. And this was a picture. He was speaking about John the Baptist. And he said he will turn their hearts of the fathers to their children, the hearts of the children to their fathers. Then, 400 years later, when John the Baptist comes, he begins to preach exactly that. So, it's no wonder that people were excited. Yeah? It's no wonder that people went out to the wilderness. What is this prophet saying? Because 400 years earlier, this had been predicted. And for 400 years, there had been silence. And then John the Baptist comes. Now, we know John the Baptist's message. So I want to ask you, what was the message of John the Baptist? You tell me. Repent. Okay, that was one of the things. That was the primary. Repent. What else did he do? He baptized people, right? He baptized people. Anything else about his message? What did he say? What did he say? I am a... I'm a voice crying in the wilderness. So here we have the picture of a prophet. A prophet is one who points people to God. It's not about the prophet. It's about the message and it's about God. By the way, that's what it should always be. It's not really about you. It's about God. It's about God. And John says, there's one who's coming. He's greater than I am. Prepare the way. Get ready. Turn from your sins. Repent. He was getting people ready for the next thing that God was going to say. Because the next thing God was going to say was the most important thing thing that God would ever say to men, to women, to boys, to girls, to old people, to young people, people rich, people poor, people educated, uneducated. What God was going to say next was one that the world had to hear. The next day, what happens? In John 1, 29 and 30, the next day, John saw Jesus coming towards him. What does that mean, the next day? If you look at your Bibles, you will see that the day before, John had baptized Jesus. John had baptized Jesus. The next day, John sees Jesus, and what is his message at this point? What is his message? He says, look! The Lamb of God who takes away the sin of the world. Oh, brothers and sisters, what a wonderful verse that we'll get back to just a little bit later this morning. But I want you to look at that. John comes. He's been saying, prepare the way. Get ready. There's one who's coming who's greater than I am. And then that day he sees him and he says, look. And John sees and understands and knows this is the one that my message has been about. This is the one for whom I've been preparing the way. This is the one. It's all about him. And John, who had no ego at all, I think that's why God could use him. You know? No ego. It wasn't about John. He says, look, look, this is the one I was speaking about. And do you remember? Some of those, like Peter and some of the others, those who had been following John and they were his disciples, what happened when John, said, when John said that? Do you know? You go back and read. You know what you'll find? Immediately, they left John and they started following Jesus because he's the one. He's the one. No ego. I think when we don't have ego involved, God can really use us for his work. But when our egos get involved, it's about me and, and it's important that I, 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 John says, I'm a voice. And then when John said, look, 
That's the one I was talking about. The Lamb of God who takes away the sin of the world. John knew this is God speaking. This is God's message. This is God's voice. And so we've got everything in the Old Testament. This prophet knew a little bit, but he didn't understand everything. This prophet knew something else, and he, and he said what God gave him to say, but he didn't get the whole picture. And this one said a little bit more, but he didn't have the whole picture as well. But what do we read? Now, hold on to that, and now let's go back to Hebrews chapter 1 again. In the last days, God spoke in this way and that way, but now, in verse 2 and 3, we read, In these final days... He has spoken to us through His Son. In these final days, brothers and sisters, you and I this morning, understand it carefully, we are part of these final days. You says, oh, that was just for them. No, 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 no. You look carefully at the Bible. We are part of these final days. And in these final days, God has spoken to what? Us through His Son. What is the message of God? It is in Jesus. What is the heart of God? It is in Jesus. What does God want us to know? It is in Jesus. It's not in the church. It's not in religion. It's not in this. It's not in that. It's in Jesus. It's in Jesus. This is how in these last days God has spoken to us. And what it says here Understand what he's saying. In these final days, he has spoken to us through his son. Here's the final word, brothers and sisters. Here's the final message. You say, yeah, 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 but Pastor Jennifer, but still the gospels had to be written. Yes, but they were the story of Jesus. Yeah, but what about all the letters of Paul and Peter and all of those others? Those letters described, the, the, those letters explained and commented the doctrine that came out of Jesus and God and all of that. What about the book of Revelation? That is the culmination of it all when Jesus takes in his hands and then returns it to the Lord again. It's all about Jesus. All about Jesus. And if you go back to the Old Testament, do you know what you'll find? It's all about Jesus. It's all about Jesus. And that's why as we come into this the, the Good Friday and we think about the death of Jesus and then the resurrection and his return to heaven, it's all about Jesus. Old Testament and New Testament. And that's why the writer to Hebrews says, in these last days, he has spoken to us through his son. Do you know what? That's why when people say, it doesn't matter what you believe, just believe, just be good, be sincere. There are many, many ro roads to God. You can communicate to God. You can communicate with God in many ways. H have you heard people say that? Have you maybe felt that before? Just these few words right here, these few verses, and there's much, much more than that. I I'm so glad there's going to be uh, this ap apologetics, this conference coming up. It's from Ravi Zacharias Ministries um, that explain and go into more detail. But here it tells us all as well, it's through Jesus. And so there aren't many ways to Jesus. How are you going to communicate with God? Oh, people try all sorts of ways. God says, I speak through Jesus. I speak through Jesus. I speak through Jesus. That is his word to us. That's his final word to us. That's his complete word to us. That's his whole word to us. Everything that is tied with that. Now, we want to go a little bit further, so here we have, and then I want you to look a little bit more. Let's look at what it says. I've, I've not included everything in the verse, so you go back and read it on your own. We're looking at a few parts this morning. Verse 3, the sun radiates God's own glory. Now, look at your translations. Some of our translations don't say radiate, right? Some of our translations say radiance. Some translations say what? brightness. Some translations say reflection even, right? But I want to encourage you this morning when you look at this verse to think of it in this way. And I want to use an ast astronomical example to help us understand. Okay? Nighttime. You walk outside. You look up in the night sky and there's this beautiful bright moon. Thank you. <laughs> 
You got to go back to school. That's what you got to do. <laughs> that, that was not a trick question. So the moon is up there. And the moon, what do we say? We say that the moon is shining, right? But in fact, is there any light coming from the moon itself? No. It's only a reflection, right? There's nothing in the moon itself that sends forth light. It's a reflection. Where does the light come from? The sun. Then daytime comes. And you walk outside and you put on your sunglasses because up there in the sky there is shining what? The sun. Where does the light of the sun come from? It comes from itself. It comes from itself. It is, so it's shining, it comes from itself. It puts out what it is, light. Light and heat and all of that. And here's an understanding for us about Jesus in this. The sun radiates God's own glory in the same way that the S-U-N, the sun in the sky, radiates. It's not just He shines the light of God. He is God. He is the light of God. He is God. So it's not like a moon, oh, I reflect. He is like that himself because he is God. And so he reflects, not reflects, he radiates God. He is God. Let me ask you something. How many of you, you've ever met somebody before and you thought, wow, I like these people. I like this person so much. Really nice. Yeah. Oh, I, oh really a good person. The outside was very good, wasn't it? <laughs> And then you got to know them a little bit better and what was underneath the outside wasn't so great, right? It wasn't so great. So the outward, what was coming out, was different from what was inside. The Greek word here means outside and inside is the same, is the same. And so... Jesus is the same outside and inside. Everything that God says about Jesus, it's the same outside and inside. Do you sometimes look at the promises of God and the Word of God and you wonder, how can this be? Can I really trust? Can I really believe? Yes, you can. You can because what is outside and what is inside, it's the same. It's the same. And so the writer to Hebrews says the sun. Jesus radiates God's own glory. He radiates God's own glory. And then, because he is God. He is God. And then, what's the second part of this? He expresses the very character of God. Do you know what this part means right here? The character of God? In Roman and Greek times, the word in the Greek had to do with uh, like an imprint or a signet ring, you know? It had something, and they would take this, or like a seal. They would take the seal, and then with wax or something like that, hot wax, they would then press that seal or that signet ring into the wax, okay? And what was in the wax, when it was done right, when it was done properly, was a perfect imprint a perfect expression of the ring, of the seal. It was exactly the same. That's what that means. That's what that means. The character of God. So here's this picture for us again. Here's Jesus. Here's Jesus. And he is the perfect imprint of God. He perfectly expresses who God is. We get a perfect picture of God when we look at Christ. Jesus is the visible expression of God's invisible being. In other words, Jesus explains God to us. Jesus expresses God to us. Jesus shows God to us because that's who he is. Have you ever wondered what is God like? I wonder, I want to know what God is like. Pastor Rene and I used to work with uh, a man that had a really messed up life. We worked with him two years maybe or more, two years, two or three times a week. And he was really messed up mentally. He, he, had, he had messed up his brain with all sorts of drugs and things like that. And he was messed up mentally. He was messed up. 
physically, emotionally, and really messed up spiritually. And we would work with him every, every week and talk with him. And we would talk with him. He'd listen. And then he'd come back in the next day. And it was always the same thing. Always the same thing. He said, I like Jesus, but I don't like God. <laughs> always. Uh, always. And he would look, he say, see, because Jesus is loving, but look at God. And he'd look at the Old Testament. God is whatever. And we'd talk with him, and he could never bring the two together. He could never re reconcile. He always split. There's Jesus and there's God. There's God. And you know what? I've met people like that before. Have you? Oh, Jesus, yeah, he's love, but God. And they have a bad picture, a bad image of God. Or maybe they think of their own maybe they're poor family relationships with fathers or others, and so they can't, oh, no, I, I, don't, I don't like God. God is too hard, yeah? God is too holy, right? God is too demanding. I can't, I can't please God. God is angry with me because I have sinned. God is disappointed with me because, is just disappointed with me because my life, I've messed up things in my life. Jesus is okay, but I want to stay away from God. I, I, can't, I, I can't have a relationship with him. Brothers and sisters, what God is saying to us is, Jesus is who I am. You want to know who I am? I'm Jesus. This is Jesus. You want to know what I'm like? Jesus. Do you want to know my heart for you? Jesus. Do you want to know how I feel about you? Jesus. And so that's why the writer to Hebrews says, in these last days, he has spoken to us by his son. Is there anything better? Is there a better word than Jesus? Is there a better expression than Jesus? Is there anything more loving than Jesus? Is there anything more truthful and upright and holy than Jesus? Because that's part of it. Remember what it says? It says that Jesus was full of grace and truth. See, that's part, that's part of it as well. Perfectly holy, perfectly holy. And so when we see Jesus, we see God. God is saying in essence, you can know me. This is who I am and this is what I am like. Well, brothers and sisters, then what is he like? What is he like? Well, we could take five Bible theology courses on the character and nature of God and it would take months and months and months. Can't do that because we've only got 17 minutes, 19 minutes, something like that. So what do we want to focus on this morning? One thing is this. He is the God who has come to us. He wants to communicate with you. He wants to speak to you. He wants you to hear Him. He wants you to know Him. He wants to have a relationship with you. Why else would God, God the Father, send God the Son to earth? Look with me at John 1.14. I love this. One of my favorite verses. So powerful. Um, your, your NIV or New King, ja uh, King James may say, the Word became flesh and dwelt among us. This is a more modern translation. The Word became what? Human and took up residence among us. He made His home among us. He made His home among us. And I want you to think about that for just a minute. Oh, there's so much in this, this small expression. You see, Jesus was God. What if God the Father, God the Son, and God the Spirit had looked down at our messed up earth and said, Oh, yo, these people are such a mess. Okay, let's go down and communicate with them. And Jesus, as God the Son, came down to earth. Imagine that. Jesus as God the Son, coming as God the Son, floating above the ground two or three feet, shining in all His glory and splendor never tired, never weary, never broken hearted, never any of these things. God the Son. Well, He would have been on earth, but what kind of relationship, communication, and fellowship could you have had with, with Him if He had come in that way? Very little, right? Very little. And so how does He come? Oh, many, many reasons, but I want us to see this this morning. It says... He became what? 
human. He became human. He became like you and me. He became like us so that, so that he could be, he would be one of us. So there was communication. There's fellowship. There's understanding. Of course, when we come to the cross and the death of Jesus, we understand much, much more why he became human. But he, came, he became human, like us. He came. So I see God, and we see God as a God who communicates, who wants to talk with you, who wants to fellowship with you. Instead of this morning, instead of thinking, oh, God up in heaven, way off up there, he doesn't want to talk with me. My life is a mess, and I'm not even really, I don't even really like him very much, so I know he doesn't like me, because I'm doing my own thing. Understand this morning that this is the God that we're talking about. He loves you. He wants to have a relationship with you. He wants to speak to you this morning. He's not a silent God. He's not a silent God. Many years ago, uh, when I was in the U.S. and I was a, a young person, I think I was Tamara's age, maybe a little bit older than Tamara, uh, we had an outreach in our small town. I'm from Alabama, a small town in the south. and. Um, in those days, when I was a much younger person, the relationship between blacks and whites was very bad, um, especially in larger cities. In our, in our town, there weren't bad relationships, there just weren't relationships. The blacks lived in their area, the whites lived in their area, the blacks went to their school, the whites went to their school, uh, the blacks went to their church, the whites went to their church. Oh my goodness, a church like Lighthouse? Forget it. <laughs> there never would have been anything like that. And that's the town that, that we were in. And we found out that in our town that the black church had no Sunday school. None of the children were being reached. No gospel stories. They weren't learning about Jesus. They weren't going to church. So on Sunday mornings they'd, and other times they'd just be walking on the streets because there was nothing in the church for the kids. And so our church where mom and dad were pastoring, they decided we send missionaries all over the world to tell people about Jesus who haven't heard. And here in our own hometown, there's a whole group of people that haven't heard about Jesus. And so we began to reach out and we began to minister to, to all, so many, many of the black kids of the town. And so um, they started coming to church and we, we'd bring them, we'd pick them up and then we'd, and there was one little boy, um, we would then on Wednesday nights, we'd drive them home. After the, after the Bible study, we'd feed them, we'd talk about Jesus, we'd love them, and, um, and, and we just created a scandal in the, in, the, in the town because, you know, blacks go to black churches, whites go to white churches, which so is not God, right? Which so is not God. Um, which is one of the reasons at Lighthouse, we're all in the same pot together, stirred around. Amen? Amen. So on Wednesday nights, we would drive the kids home. And there was one little boy who loved Miss Martha. And Miss Martha was, she was the one that would often drive them home. And she loved them. She was a single lady, never, never married. And she, she loved them so much. And they knew that she loved them. And they loved her, too. And there's one little boy. His name was Mailbox. So that was, that was his name, Mailbox. And Mailbox loved Miss Martha. And Mailbox would always run, and he'd get in the car, and he'd sit right next to Miss Martha, and he would tell her, take me home last. Take me home last. Because he wanted, because he knew she loved him, and his home life was really terrible, very little love, and it was just, it was a tough family situation. But he knew that Miss Martha loved him, and she told him about Jesus, and she showed the love of Jesus in a very practical way. And he would always say, take me home last. So Miss Martha would take him home last. And so Betty was reminding me of this story um, when I was home this last time. And uh, one evening, Miss Martha took mailbox home last again. And as he got out of the car, he turned back around and he said to her, tell Jesus hello for me, or hey is what he said. Tell Jesus hey for me. She said, what? <laughs> And Mailbox looked at her, he was, a, well, he was about five years old, and he said, tell Jesus I said, hey, he lives with you, doesn't he? <laughs> and Mailbox believed Jesus lived in the house of Miss Martha, you know? That's, that's where he lived on earth. And we were thinking, and he truly, that's that, in his understanding as a five-year-old boy, 
Jesus lived in Miss Martha's house because she was so loving and so kind and she talked about Jesus all the time. So tell Jesus hey for me, okay? But I was thinking about that. And you know what? That's true, isn't it? Because Jesus became human and he took up residence. He made his home among us. This morning, if you are a child of God, the Holy Spirit lives in you, and through the Holy Spirit, Jesus has made his home with you. He took up residence. And brothers and sisters, do you know what? People should look at your life and my life, and they should, in essence, be able to say, tell Jesus, hey, for me, because he lives with you, doesn't he? I, I really mean that. People should see in our lives Jesus. And people should see all of Jesus because this says he was full of unfailing love and truth. NIV says grace and truth. Other things say other things. Love and truth. And all of that was in Jesus. And there are some people that, oh, love, 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 mercy, mercy, mercy. There are other people that are truth, 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 truth. You've got to be right. You've got to be holy. Don't, now that was wrong or whatever. Brothers and sisters, Jesus was both. Jesus was both, and it has to be both. It must be both. It must be both. Full of grace and truth. Full of, un, full of love, unfailing love and truth. And so when we see Jesus, we, we see that this is, what is he like? He became human, and he took up residence with us. He took up residence with us. What else do I want us to look at and think about this morning as we're thinking about Resurrection Sunday coming and Easter coming? I'd like you to think as well, as we think about God's character completely and perfectly expressed in Jesus, I want you to think about God's full expression of love in Jesus. And then I want you to think about the full expression of love that in Jesus. So God's full expression of love is Jesus. What is the full expression of love that Jesus shows us? It is the cross. It is the cross. It is the cross. In the Old Testament, what does it say in Hebrews? In this way and that way. We saw a little bit about Jesus, but we didn't really understand. Is it this or it's that? Is Jesus, you say, oh no, Pastor Jennifer, Jesus isn't in the Old Testament. Jesus is in the New Testament. Matthew, Mark, Luke, John. Oh, my dear friends, Jesus is all over the place in the Old Testament. He's, in, he's pictured in the Garden of Eden. You say, Jesus in the Garden of Eden? Yes. What happened when Adam and Eve sinned and their nakedness was exposed? God had to do what? He had to take an innocent animal. He had to kill that animal. And he used the skins to cover their nakedness. That's a picture of Jesus who was killed and covers, does away with our sin. You move forward to the children of Israel in Egypt. And God said, my angel is going to pass over tonight. So you, you take a lamb and you kill that lamb. It must be a perfect lamb. No defect. You say, why would God say that? They didn't understand that it was about Jesus who is the perfect Lamb of God. What does John the Baptist say? Behold what? The Lamb of God who takes away the sins of the world. All the way back in the Old Testament. And God says, take that perfect Lamb. Kill it. Put the blood on the side and on the top of the door. And when I see that, I will pass over. I will pass over. In the Old Testament, it's Jesus. That's why when people say, oh, God in the Old Testament, he's so mean, he's so hard. No, he's not. No, he's not. Was he perfectly holy? Yes. Did sin have to be paid for? Yes. But he provided a way to pay. It's God in the Old Testament, full of grace, full of truth. Both of those things. And that's Jesus in the Old Testament. Did they understand it? No, they didn't understand it. And then we move forward a little bit more. Go to the book of Leviticus. How many of you love the book of Leviticus? It's your favorite book. Only Keith, you are alone. How many of you, you read the book of Leviticus? Honestly. 
Honestly, you read it and you say, sacrifice, 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 sacrifice. And this is the way I do it. Do you know why the book of Leviticus is in the Old Testament? The book of Leviticus is about Jesus. It's about the price that must be paid for sin. The price, why? Because God was full of truth. God was holy, but God was also full of love. And you come to Leviticus, and when, there's, when sin happens, the sinner brings the animal to the tabernacle. And then what happens? The sacrifice has to be killed. You go back and look at Leviticus. Who has to kill the sacrifice? The priest? No. You go back and you read. You read Leviticus 1. You read the other ones. Now, did the priests help? Yes. Did the priests sprinkle the blood? Yes. Do you know what Leviticus says? The one who brings the sacrifice kills the sacrifice. That's what it says in Leviticus. That's what it says. And then the blood is, is shed. It's a bloody thing. It was hard. It was awful. It cost something. It was terrible. And that's so that you and I know thousands and thousands of years later that sin costs something. That God is holy. That a price has to be paid. But the wonderful thing is that God is not just a God of truth. God is a God of love. And so he gave a, a sacrifice. There was a price that could be paid. And then when we come to the New Testament, go back to um, uh, 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 John 3, 1. Behold the Lamb of God. The Lamb of God who takes away the sin of the world. And I want you to think about that as we come to Resurrection Sunday, as we come to Good Friday, as we're thinking about these things. And I want you to think about the Lamb of God who takes away the sin of the world. Somebody's going to have to pay the price. Somebody's going to have to take. And God speaks to us, Jesus. Jesus, the Lamb of God. Not a little pet lamb. Oh, so cute. A lamb for sacrifice. Who killed Jesus? In Leviticus, the person took the sacrifice and they had to slit the throat. They had to slit the throat. Now the priests did things, but you read again in that, in, in, in that, especially in Leviticus 1, when you look at that. Did the Romans kill Jesus? No. Did Pilate kill Jesus? No. Did the Jewish leaders kill Jesus? No. I killed Jesus. I killed Jesus. You killed Jesus. You say, what? No, no. We did. We did. It was my sin. The price had to be paid. And Jesus, the love of God, the expression of God, the Lamb of God, who takes away the sins of the world. There's a price for sin because He's a holy God. But the price is paid in love by holy God Himself. And I had to kill Je I killed Jesus. My sins killed Jesus. Your sins killed Jesus. Just like that person had to take that sacrificial animal that was perfect and slit the throat. And the blood was poured out. But God paid the price because God gave Jesus. And so in these last days, in these last days, God has spoken through Jesus. And Jesus is love. Is he truth? He's truth. But God has provided in Jesus all that we need. We close with, with John chapter 3, verses 16 and 17. There's so much, brothers and sisters, there's so much more here. There's so, so, so much more. This was a simple, you say simple? Simple today. But we look at John 3, 16 and 17. For God so loved the world that he gave his one and only Son, that whoever believes in him shall not perish, but have eternal life. Did God send Jesus to condemn us? Brothers and sisters, we're already condemned. Without Jesus, I'm going to hell. Without Jesus, you're going to hell. Without Jesus, I can't communicate with God. I can't be a good enough Buddhist. I can't be a good enough Muslim. I can't be a good enough atheist. I have to have Jesus. 
have to have Jesus. And God gave Jesus, and Jesus came, that I wouldn't be condemned, but that I might know God is a God of love and truth. They both fit together, and it's through Jesus. So in these last days, God speaks through Jesus. Let's close in prayer this morning. And then we're going to, I just want us to, at the end, we're just going to sing uh, God so loved this whole world again. Let's pray. Would you ask God to prepare your heart in these days leading up to Resurrection Sunday and Good Friday for the, for the truth and for the seriousness and for the awesomeness of what God did in Jesus Lord, we come to you this morning. We thank you that in these last days, you have spoken through Jesus. Lord, I pray this morning for anybody here who does not yet know Jesus. Lord, may they know this morning that you speak to us through Jesus and that through Jesus we can know you. Lord, I want to know you. I open my heart to Jesus. I accept Jesus to pay the price for my sin and I give you my life. And I look to you. Oh God, I want to have a relationship with you through Jesus and Jesus alone. Lord, for those of us who already know you and are living in relationship with you, I pray that in these days as we come up to the time that is the most wonderful time for us as your children, as we remember your sacrifice, your death, and your resurrection, make it real and fresh and new and important to us again. Oh, you have made your home with us. May people see you in us, love and truth expressed and poured out. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen. Could we stand and sing just as a closing? We're going to sing.